Hello to everyone who's already on the call. I think we've, we've got a good number of participants. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few late arrivals, but I think we'll get going as we've got quite a tight uh, agenda today. So first of all, hello to everyone who has joined the Clean Arctic Alliance's first webinar on Black Carbon, the Arctic and Shipping. First of all, a couple of housekeeping matters. Please note the information on this slide and in particular, the fact that this webinar will be recorded. And secondly, if you have any questions, could you please indicate to which speaker the question is directed and submit it via the Zoom question and answer option, which we, and we will endeavor to answer all of the questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If time runs out on us, we will follow up with a response after the event. Next slide, please. This is the first of two webinars we're planning to host on the subject of black carbon emissions from shipping and its impact on the Arctic. It is 13 years since a paper recognizing that black carbon is a potent climate forcer was submitted to the International Maritime Organization's Marine Environment Protection Committee. And at that time, it was estimated that between 50,000 and 71,500 metric tons of black carbon was emitted by shipping globally. More recently, the International Council on Clean Transportation has estimated that as of 2015, ships are emitting up to 80,000 tons of black carbon per year. And the International Maritime Organization's fourth greenhouse gas study to be published in the coming months could show that that figure is even higher now. Over a decade on since the alarm was first raised, ships continue to emit black carbon globally, including in the Arctic in comparatively close proximity to Arctic snow and ice. And black carbon emissions from shipping are still increasing. Between 2015 and 2019, there was an 85% increase in black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic, as Dr. Comer will show shortly in his presentation. The International Maritime Organization, having spent some time defining black carbon and identifying methods to measure emissions, is now at the point where members are beginning to consider appropriate control measures to reduce the impact on the Arctic of black carbon emissions from international shipping. The next meeting of its Marine Environment Protection Committee has received a proposal for a resolution on black carbon emissions and an intersessional correspondence group is due to report on the linkages between the measurement of black carbon and policy options early next year. With this as the backdrop, the Clean Arctic Alliance felt that it would only be timely to now organize a short series of events on this very relevant issue. We have four speakers today. Dr. Pam Pearson, Director of the International Climate Cryosphere Initiative, James Gamble, Arctic Program Director with Pacific Environment. Kristen Linda Arna Dottir, Chair of the Arctic Council's Expert Group on Black Carbon and Methane. And Dr. Brian Comer with the International Council on Clean Transportation. We'll move straight from one speaker to the next with a brief introduction to each, and we'll keep any questions to the final session of the webinar. So our first speaker today is Dr. Pam Pearson, director and founder of the International Climate Cryosphere Initiative. Pam is a former diplomat who has served 20 years with the US State Department, working on a range of global issues, including climate change. She was part of the Kyoto Protocol negotiating team and from 1999 to 2003, counselor and acting deputy ambassador to Norway. Pam founded ICCI immediately after COP15 to bring greater attention and policy focus to the rapid and markedly similar changes occurring to cryosphere regions throughout the globe and the need for intensified and specific mitigation efforts to slow these changes and allow greater adaptation by local peoples. Over to you, Pam. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. Um, and as I'm doing that, I want to offer one correction. I have the greatest respect for scientists. I actually am not uh, a PhD. Um, 
So with that said, however, um, I'm going to go into a lot of science right now uh, and very quickly um, go through why the Arctic is so important to minimizing risks of reaching tipping points or thresholds, not just in the Arctic, but in the global climate system. Um, what studies by the IPCC and others say that we need to do to avoid these? And then black carbon specific role in addressing uh, Arctic climate change and therefore these global feedbacks. These are very complex issues. I'm happy to take questions, but also to take uh, not just questions now, but by email afterwards. Um, okay. Uh, this mostly is based on two recent IPCC reports, the Oceans and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate that came out in September of last year, and also the 1.5 degree report, which came out in October of 2018. And the main message from that report is that holding temperatures within 1.5 degrees C requires rapid systematic changes on an unprecedented scale acting within the next decade to minimize uh, uh, emissions and take us down by 50% in all sectors, energy lands, transport, infrastructure, as well as industry and among all countries and, and stakeholders. Um, but an important thing to keep in mind as I have at the headline here is that although 1.5 degrees is still possible, um, and that is a continuing message that needs to get out. We, we have not yet uh, gotten to a point where we're going to exceed that level. Even 1.5 degrees in global mean temperature means three degrees in the Arctic. And these graphs from AMAP uh, of the Arctic Council, which is sort of the science arm of the Arctic Council, shows in one way why this is. Uh, there you see under different emissions scenario, blue is a low emissions, red a high emissions scenario. Um, the annual mean of the Arctic is, of course, much higher under both of these scenarios than the global mean, but where you really see differences is the winter in the Arctic. It is simply, under both kinds of emission scenario, much higher, and once you reach the melting point of water, things start changing. And I'm just going to go through some of the uh, Arctic as well as global risks. Uh, in Russia, there are risks of uh, to infrastructure from permafrost thaw and collapse. The red shows where that risk is greatest, but as you can see, almost the entire country has some level of risk. Permafrost thaw, though, globally decreases the carbon budgets of all countries. The light pink that you see here is the amount of carbon coming out of permafrost at 1.5 degrees, respective 2 degrees C. And when this is taken into account, the amount of carbon that can then be emitted by humans is uh, therefore much lower. Uh, summer sea ice is going to be lost around 1.7 degrees. There was a consensus study that came out uh, just in April. And as you can see in this interesting way of doing things graphically, today we're a bit above one degree. By 1.5 degrees, we're probably going to have a few days or weeks of uh, occasional years with loss of sea ice. But by two degrees, we would be ice free for several months every year. Now that might seem that it's good for shipping, but it's very bad for the global climate system because you get a lot of feedbacks and among them is the complete loss of multi-year ice. Um, many outside the Arctic don't realize that multi-year ice, the very thick ice, is its own ecosystem. You can think about it as the coral reef in a way of the, the Arctic and a lot of species live in here. It's a real basis for the food system. Uh, cod are among those, and as you can see under a high emission scenario, cods will simply not be able to reproduce, uh, which has, and that's just one species of the many high latitude uh, fishery species that are going to be pressed by loss of sea ice, also by increased uh, freshening that is changing the, the uh, ecosystem of the Arctic Ocean to make it almost more like the Atlantic. And of course, these species have nowhere else they can go. Another thing that's occurring, and this is uh, unpublished data that we actually just came up with because ICCI also works on uh, things such as uh, open burning. 
is that you're getting increasing Arctic feedback loops from uh, emissions from fires in the high north. And the Laptive Sea is known almost as the nursery of sea ice in the Arctic. It's where a lot of it forms initially and then moves through. And 2020 was uh, already a huge fire year. Just in May to June, you can see to the left maps of fires in uh, near the, the Laptive Sea. And emissions of black carbon Carbon were much, much greater in 2020, uh, as you can see, uh, compared to 2018 and 2019. But we can't forget also from a warmer and drier Arctic uh, with the heat waves that have been taking place in Siberia, you get other emissions as well. And the amount of CO2 from the fires just as in this one smaller area of this uh, uh, oblast or republic of Russia were 13 times Sweden's reported CO2 emissions in 2019. So these are large emissions and they have global feedbacks. So the greatest impacts actually from the Arctic occur outside of the Arctic, permafrost thaw and emissions, which continue actually for about 200 years after that initial thaw. So part of what that means is that even if we're able to take temperatures down again, we're going to need to have negative emissions just to offset what's continuing to occur from permafrost. Sea level rise from loss of the Greenland ice sheet and Arctic glaciers anywhere from two to seven meters, depending on how high we allow temperatures to go. Loss of glaciers and snow in places like Scandinavia and the Northern Rockies and Iceland. Um, in the Arctic Ocean and high latitude seas, not just freshening and eutrophication, but also acidification from uh, higher levels of CO2, which will lead to fisheries collapse. Potential slowing of the uh, AMOC, the ocean circulation currents, and also mid-latitude weather patterns. And the IPCC in its 2019 uh, special report on oceans and cryospheres found that all of these were observed or in progress already today at one degree C. Um, now, in this context then, there are a lot of black carbon sectors that impact the Arctic. It's important to take into account though, not just the level of emissions, but where those emissions occur, because depending on where they occur, black carbon is a local or regional pollutant. And so for example, this is a study we did together with the World Bank in 2013. And this shows the greatest impacts, this combination of both the amount of BC that's in Emitted, but also the amount of it that reaches the Arctic and causes impacts there. So you can see that there's a lot of impact from cook stoves, even though there aren't a lot of cook stoves in the Arctic itself. On the other hand, things such as wood stoves, which are very much an Arctic and even a Northern Arctic uh, phenomenon in many ways, have an oversized impact, even though their numbers are much smaller than cook stoves. Um, and as you can see, there's no shipping here because at the time that this study was done, there wasn't that much, but there were already projections. This is uh, done by Corbett and colleagues back in 2007. And we're looking at potential black carbon and also ozone increases. And this is important because ozone is both a pollutant for health, but also for warming. Um, occurring by 2050 with projections of increased shipping. And this is very, very close, of course, to the ice, some in some cases going with icebreakers right through the ice. And that's why shipping uh, presents a very unique threat to increasing the loss of ice in the Arctic and therefore uh, global warming. So to sort of recap in terms of what is necessary, according to the IPCC, we need emissions reductions uh, in time for the Arctic time scale to prevent some of these feedbacks from occurring. A lot of it focuses on CO2 of a robust declining trend already in the next decade. We need to reach net zero around mid-century. Um, hopefully some level of carbon dioxide removal, but less of that will be needed because it's very uncertain if we can reduce emissions instead. But this also assumes that non-CO2 emissions, including black carbon, are strongly reduced and certainly that these should not go up, again, especially in the Arctic. There are a number of groups that work on Arctic black carbon. Um, you'll hear quite soon from the Arctic Council, of course. And the Arctic Council is the only body that actually has a commitment to a reduction of 25 to 33 and a third percent by 2025. 
the LERTAP convention uh, through its Gothenburg protocol talks about black carbon as a constituent of particle pollution, PM 2.5. And of course, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and UNEP work on black carbon globally, but that includes in its transport initiative, which uh, ICCT leads. You'll hear from them later on shipping. So uh, these are the reports I mentioned. The sixth assessment of the IPCC is in its uh, second order draft at this point in time. And we've done a summary of some of the cryosphere impacts uh, at the link you see there. So with that, I will turn things over to um, the next speaker and Sean to introduce. Thank you, Pam. Uh, we, as Pam says, we'll move straight on with our second presentation. James or Jim Gamble was born and raised and educated in Alaska. He directed the Aleut International Association from 2007 to 2017, including six years as its executive director and CEO. Jim bring, brings a deep commitment to the empowerment of indigenous leadership, evidenced through his work with the Alaska Native leaders and initiatives he started at AIA. These include increasing AIA's participation at the Arctic Council, where it serves as one of the international indigenous permanent participants. Jim has also helped manage a project to map subsistence activities in five Alaskan and three Russian locales, and the production of an Arctic Council endorsed report on the impact of heavy fuel oil on indigenous communities and subsistence practices. Jim, who is currently Arctic Program Director with Pacific Environment, is also a board member of Arctic 360 and a senior fellow at the Institute of the North. Jim, you now have the floor. Okay, thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. And uh, good morning, everybody from um, Anchorage, Alaska. I'm going to uh, attempt to share my screen as well. And uh, talk about a few things related to human health and black carbon. Okay, and hopefully everybody will be able to see that very soon. A uh, couple of quick things just to say that uh, I want to thank the Ar Clean Arctic Alliance, of course, uh, and uh, also uh, to let everyone know that um, this is going to be a high-level presentation. And, and uh, as Pam mentioned, I'm not a scientist either, but I've worked uh, very closely with uh, black carbon in the Arctic Council and its effect on people in the Arctic. Uh, so apologies to those that are probably better versed in this topic uh, than I am that are out in the audience. And um, also uh, apologies beforehand as my, uh, as, uh, my cat might enter the, uh, the chat at any time as well. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a bit about black carbon and why it's a human health threat, what sort of its uh, composition means and why it's so dangerous. Um, then I'm going to give some shipping examples, uh, uh, in particular talking about cruise vessels. Um, then some other ways that black carbon uh, can really affect the, the human health of Arctic residents and, and close with some final thoughts. So to get started, let's look at black carbon and, and really why it's so dangerous. So black carbon, of course, is a uh, component of, of uh, particulate matter 2.5, uh, meaning uh, roughly 2.5 microns in size. And, and uh, uh, for comparison in the bottom left, we can see a, an example of, of how two, PM 2.5 relates to something like a human hair or, or, or beach sand. It's very, very small. And, and that's in fact what makes it really quite harmful in terms of, uh, in terms of human health and air pollution. Um, uh, the European um, Environment Association uh, uh, mentions that of all air pollutants, uh, particulate matter is, is probably the most harmful to human health uh, from a European perspective. And the black carbon portion of PM uh, 2.5 is particularly harmful because it's very fine, uh, at least partly carcinogenic and, and small enough to enter the bloodstream and, and organs. Um, uh, for this reason, PM 2.5 is uh, probably responsible to, for between half and three quarters of the total harm that air pollution causes. And, 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 and so as we know, uh, air pollution as a, as a human health problem has been with us essentially uh, um, since before the industrial age. The, w, the World Health Organization has classified uh, particulate pollution as a group one carcinogen. Uh, and, and that means there's no safe level. And, and uh, PM uh, 2.5, as, as mentioned, is particularly deadly uh, with consequences for heart disease, for respiratory disease. And, and in fact, for every rise in the amount of, uh, of PM 2.5 that populations are exposed to, there is a, um, 
a subsequent rise in, in the level of lung cancer that, that those populations experience. So um, uh, again, no safe level of PM2.5 and black carbon is a particularly dangerous component uh, of PM2.5. So from a shipping perspective, a good example I think to look at um, is, is cruise vessels because cruise vessels uh, uh, are increasingly present in the Arctic and subarctic. Uh, uh, this year, of course, represents kind of an interesting opportunity to look at uh, the environment of some of these communities and some of these routes without cruise vessels. And in fact, in the state of Alaska, there's, a current, there's currently a study happening to look at air quality in cruise communities uh, uh, to use this year as a baseline uh, to be able to compare it uh, uh, subsequent years when cruise vessels return. And so um, uh, ships cause, uh, of course, greenhouse gas pollution, uh, but also uh, a number of other pollutants from uh, are, are, uh, come from cruise vessels, uh, including sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. Uh, but particulate matter in particular is what we're talking about here. And it's a lot of particulate matter. Um, uh, one study uh, referenced by NABU uh, shows that uh, per day, one cruise ship can emit, emit as much particulate matter as a million cars. So 30 cruise vessels uh, pollute as much as all the cars in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, if you think about the number of cruise visits that, that happen in a place like Southeast Alaska, um, that uh, uh, is a considerable amount of particulate pollution that potentially uh, uh, populations are exposed to. And, and uh, these concentrations uh, can be quite large, uh, especially the closer you are to the vessel. And so uh, uh, a recent study uh, sponsored by Standout Earth showed that that particulate matter on the decks of these ships uh, are comparable to concentrations in very polluted cities like uh, Beijing and Santiago. And, and so for a person who's on a vessel, thinking they're, they're in the open water and the open air, um, they might actually be exposed to considerable amounts of, of, of uh, particulate matter pollution. And, um, and so uh, you could sort of look at it uh, from the perspective of if you're standing on the vessel, uh, you're exposed. If, you're, if the vessel's in port and you live in the port community, you're exposed. And, and in fact, if you live in a community that's close to shipping lanes, um, you are exposed. And so uh, even very remote places um, that are close to shipping lanes might have a significant uh, uh, PM 2.5 and black carbon problem because of their proximity to a lot of ship traffic. And a good example of that in Alaska in an area that I worked uh, quite extensively was the Aleutian Islands, which are quite close to the Great Circle Route uh, between uh, North America and Asia. Uh, and, and see maybe 20 transits of large uh, cargo vessels a day uh, uh, within within 100 miles of the of, of Aleutian communities, Aleut communities. So uh, uh, exposure can happen in a number of ways, and ships essentially bring this pollution very close to communities uh, in the north and in the Arctic. So another example of how this sort of uh, pollution and and black carbon can really affect uh, the health of communities is is really uh, goes back to the climate change effects because. Um, uh, uh, black carbon's role in changing the climate and, and hastening, for instance, the, the, um, the reduction and retreat of sea ice can have uh, uh, significant impacts on uh, the food security of indigenous uh, people of the Arctic. And um, uh, this uh, 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 danger to food security um, is not just about food and nutrition. Um, this danger is also about a uh, loss of cultural um, uh, and, uh, and uh, cultural practice and and that uh, connection to cultural practice is a strong factor in in how communities can adapt to a changing arctic and so um, as um, as uh, uh, loss of subsistence uh, uh, happens um, it is not only a, a loss of nutrition but also a loss of potentially a loss of culture and 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 the sort of the spiritual appreciation of, of of these regions. And so um, uh, thinking in terms of, of simply the sort of the chemistry of black carbon, I don't think does justice to, to, the, uh, to the, um, the significance of its effects on, on, on peoples and communities. And um, so uh, to kind of sum up, um, the World Health Organization estimates that um, ambient air pollution uh, uh, kills about 4.2 million people a year worldwide. And, and so uh, uh, PM 2.5 is probably responsible to have for half 
of four half to three quarters of these of these deaths. Um, ships burning heavy fuel will produce a tremendous amount of black carbon and a significant and very, uh, which is a very significant and dangerous component of PM 2.5. Um, now the population of the Arctic is small, uh, clearly, and, and places are spread out, but uh, ex so exposure is low, but um, it, living sh close to ship traffic brings the danger right to the community. And so that's why um, um, vessel traffic and, and ship uh, produce black carbon represents an urgent threat to, uh, can represent an urgent threat to Arctic communities. Another thing I think to, uh, that's important to keep in mind, as I mentioned, is that black carbon um, threatens the health of indigenous peoples by increasing their food insecurity. And, uh, and uh, that uh, can't just be viewed in terms of, um, of nutrition, but also in terms of culture. Um, uh, uh, current uh, information also indicates that exposure to PM 2.5 and to black carbon is likely a risk factor for the severity of COVID-19 response. And so like smoking is a risk factor and appears to increase the severity of a COVID-19 infection, uh, exposure to, uh, to black carbon and PM 2.5 also appears to uh, increase the severity of a COVID-19 uh, infection. And so uh, to sum up, uh, reduction in black carbon emissions is undoubtedly a win for people in the environment, uh, uh, both in terms of, uh, of, uh, of reducing the effects on human health and reducing the effects uh, on, the, uh, on the climate and, uh, and uh, warming that we're all experiencing. And with that, I will uh, conclude and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jim. Our third speaker for our third speaker today, we are very pleased to welcome Kristin Linda Arna Dottier, who is the chair of the Arctic Council's expert group on black carbon and methane during the Icelandic chairmanship. The main objective of this group is to assess and report on the progress of the implementation of the Arctic Council's framework for action on black carbon and methane, and to inform policymakers from the Arctic states and participating Arctic Council observer states. Kristen is the deputy CEO at Landsverkjung, which is an Icelandic power company. Landsverkjung produces 100% renewable energy from hydroelectric, geothermal, and wind facilities, and is one of Europe's largest renewable energy producers. Its daughter company, Landsverkjung Power, has participated in projects to make renewable energy accessible to remote Arctic communities. Kristen, you have the floor. Thank you, Sian. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm now going to share my uh, screen with you uh, and my presentation. I hope this will be very fast. Let's see. Uh, Yes. Uh, well, it's good afternoon from Reykjavik. Uh, we're a little bit later, later here in the day. But uh, I will go uh, briefly through what is Arctic Council and its structure. And then we'll tell you a little bit more about the expert group on black carbon and methane. And so like how we, uh, how we work, what is the structure to get things done? Uh, an important note is that the Arctic Council is an intergovernmental forum. It's not a legally, it's not built on a legally binding contract for the Arctic states. Uh, however, cooperation and the good cooperation, especially with the Arctic indigenous communities, is essential for its work. There are eight member states. Uh, however, if you think about the Arctic Council, it's good to think about it in the concept of the eight member states, uh, the six uh, indigenous permanent participants, and then the six working groups. This is sort of like the backbone of the Arctic Council work. Uh, the eight Arctic states uh, you can see here uh, are the ones which have a territory above the Arctic Circle. That is sort of like the core uh, member of the Arctic Council. Uh, but it's important to note that we have also uh, 13 non-Arctic states approved as uh, observers. 
And as we have discussed here, it's, it's important to note that uh, it's not just the Arctic states that influence the Arctic. It's what also neighboring countries uh, are doing that can uh, severely uh, affect uh, the Arctic. Uh, and I also like to point out that of these uh, 13 non-Arctic states, uh, 10 handed in a national report to the EGBCM in 2017, which was really uh, appreciated. Uh, a little bit about the permanent participants. Uh, this is, I think, one of the strongest uh, backbones in the Arctic, uh, Arctic Council uh, work, uh, that we have such a strong uh, indigenous people organization taking part uh, with full consultation rights. Uh, and uh, however, we had a very strong uh, participation from the Sami Council uh, in our group. Uh, however, they are not uh, able to take part these days. Uh, this is, uh, we, we really appreciated their voice in the work and are hoping for, uh, to get a permanent participant to work with us in the future. But we also understand that there is, uh, there are, these are small communities and there is a lot of international work going on. So they need to be very selective. And I don't need to tell you about the distances that people need to uh, address if you want to go to a meeting. A little bit more about the observers. Uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, 13 uh, non-Arctic states that have the observers uh, status, but also 14 intergovernmental and interparliamentary organization and 12 NGOs. And uh, for us working in black carbon, this is a, a really important uh, platform to take part in, in different uh, areas of work and sort of like also just to have this uh, much needed uh, coordination uh, regarding the work in general. Uh, Iceland is now in chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Uh, we have from 2019 and in 2021 in May, we will hand over the chairmanship uh, to Russia. Uh, Iceland put uh, emphasis on climate and clean, green energy solutions uh, and especially for this group that we would identify opportunities to reduce emissions of short-lived climate pollutants. And we can see that uh, both in Finland's and, and US uh, chairmanships over the years there was a strong emphasis on black carbon. And now we are finally in uh, the expert group on black carbon and methane. Uh, it was formed uh, in 2015 uh, and it is based on a framework titled Enhanced Black Carbon and Methane Emission Reduction. Uh, and it's a non-legally uh, binding agreement. Uh, but it lays out a very strong common vision for Arctic states with uh, enhanced ambitions, national and collective actions to accelerate the decline uh, in overall black carbon emissions and to significantly reduce overall methane emissions also. The expert group has a role to uh, go over uh, how the implementation is going and assess the progress towards the common vision. To do this, uh, the, the states, the Arctic states, uh, uh, have submitted biannual uh, national reports on emissions and also on the actions that they have done to reduce emission. Uh, it is also important to note, as I said before, that the non-Arctic states, the 13 of them, 10 have also handed in reports. In 2017, we put forward a very clear collective goal to reduce black carbon by 25 to 33% relative to 2013 levels. 
and that is like we are always uh, measuring uh, our success uh, in respect to 2013 levels. Uh, now we are working uh, on the third report uh, of the expert group uh, and it's planned for delivery and adoption by the ministers in May in 2021. However, I would say that our timeline is a little bit uh, later than first anticipated. Uh, some uh, countries are having difficulties to uh, hand in the national report because of the COVID-19. Uh, so we have to be a little bit more flexible uh, now. Uh, however, the previous reports has shown that black carbon emissions have declined. Uh, and uh, but what we want to really raise up is what kind of best practices uh, is uh, is showing how we can reduce black carbon, and also what is the governance structure that helps us on the way. The expert group works mainly in. Uh, uh, six priority areas and the last two agriculture and animal husbandry uh, and uh, management of wildfires were added now uh, in 2019 uh, sorry 2017 uh, and uh, uh, but before we had the mobile and stationary diesel powered sources oil and gas residential combustion and solid waste. And when uh, the nations hand in their national report, they focus on uh, these uh, priority areas, which is really important when you want to uh, deliver what is going well and what is not going as well. And from the perspective of this workshop, the most important priority area is, of course, mobile and stationary diesel powered sources. Uh, there was a change uh, in the recommendation regarding uh, recommendation 1D on uh, the action to uh, fight uh, emission from shipping. Uh, before there was just an action to accelerate work on the IMO, but now the, there was a decision to uh, broaden the recommendation to encompass uh, a broader set of potential activities and measures to be considered by Arctic states, uh, so as to include other international work uh, that uh, characterize particular matter and black carbon emission from shipping. So there's, uh, we have uh, now have a little bit of a broader scope. And that's just a little bit of uh, what we are getting from the reports. This is uh, from the last, last report from 2019. And here you can see that uh, the black carbon emissions uh, have been going down and uh, the countries are all projecting that uh, uh, there will be a significant reductions in emissions. However, as you will note, uh, we have there not uh, emission data from uh, Russia, uh, which we're hoping to get for the next report, which is, I think, um, really interesting. Uh, important factor to get the, the whole picture there. Uh, and we have also positive signs from observer countries that are uh, showing uh, there is a reduction in emission of black carbon uh, overall between the year 2013 and 2016. Uh, in the methane, we do not see as a strong curve downwards. Uh, however, there is a pro progress taking place, but 
there are many challenges still there. But it is important to note that uh, this expert group is not working uh, alone in black carbon matters. Uh, ACAP, AMA, FAME and uh, uh, Sustainable Development Working Group are all working on uh, matters that relate to uh, black carbon and actions to reduce uh, emission from uh, uh, relating to black carbon. Uh, so and that is maybe one of the, uh, the biggest issues that we're always facing is to make sure that we are connecting the different groups and the different work that is taking place. And just to end here in uh, what is the future uh, progress, uh, we are working very hard on improving the data to track the progress and also to get the data that is most up to date because it's not uh, really good to have very old data. People want uh, something uh, new. We are looking into opportunities uh, to more systematically document the policies and measures. Uh, we want to know what is really working uh, on a local level. But we also put in sort of like a call out for the states that it's good also to know what doesn't work, what basically has failed, because then other countries and other communities, they don't have to try that again. So I think we have to remember the, the value of projects that failed. Uh, still, we are always talking about the projects that went well. Uh, work in dialogue with the uh, other Arctic Council uh, working groups. Uh, as I said, the next summary, uh, next report uh, will be ready in May in 2021. Uh, and I'm hoping and post very yeah, optimistic to have a, 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 a broader uh, picture there on the actions that are taking place in the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. And so we'll move on quickly to our final speaker, Dr. Brian Comer, who is the senior researcher with the International Council on Clean Transportation's Marine Program. His research informs policies that reduce the environmental and human health impacts of air pollution from marine vessels and ports, including black carbon, he is a leading expert in HFO use and black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic, and his research has informed the IMO's ongoing policy debate on banning HFO in the Arctic and regulating black carbon emissions from ships. Over to you, Brian. Thank you, Sean. Uh, can everybody hear me and see the slides? Yes, okay. Well, thank you uh, very much for the invitation um, from the Clean Arctic Alliance to present on our work here at the ICCT. Today I'll show the results of ICCT's research on Arctic shipping and black carbon emissions, and I'll explain how close the IMO is to regulating black carbon from ships. The qualitative, or pardon me, the quantitative results in this presentation are based on data produced as part of our analysis into the effectiveness of the IMO's proposed Arctic HFO ban. Uh, so these figures may be refined and so should not be cited until we publish them later this year. Uh, with that, let's begin. So I'm showing here that black carbon emissions from ships are growing rapidly in the Arctic. This slide shows black carbon emissions from ships inside the IMO's narrowly defined Arctic region. The left panel shows black carbon emitted from heavy fuel oil fueled ships and the right one shows black carbon emitted from all of the ships, including those using distillate fuels. The bars show the relative change in emissions compared to 2015 levels, and the table below gives you the absolute values. So as you can see, black carbon emissions from HFO fueled ships were 73% uh, higher than 2015 and 2019, and total black carbon emissions were 85% higher. So we're almost twice as much in 2019, uh, just four years after 2015. This map shows black carbon emissions in the Arctic 
as defined by the IMO in 2019. And I've circled areas where black carbon emissions from ships were particularly high and identified which ship types were responsible for the majority of emissions in those areas. If you look at the bottom left near Canada and Greenland, uh, we see black carbon emissions from both carriers, general cargo ships, and, uh, and from cruise ships. Uh, moving to the right, we see black carbon emissions in an area near Svalbard with significant cruise ship traffic. Continuing on to the right, this is black carbon emissions near Western Russia in an area with heavy oil tanker traffic and also general cargo traffic. And then finally at the top, we're seeing black carbon emissions in an area where there's uh, heavy fishing activity. Here we see a breakdown of black carbon emissions by ship type in 2019. Uh, these are based on actual satellite observations of ships operating in the Arctic in 2019. And, um, and the ICCT has estimated emissions from those ships based on the methodology that's used in the fourth IMO greenhouse gas study. As you can see, fishing vessels and oil tankers each accounted for nearly 30% of black carbon emissions in the Arctic in 2019 followed by general cargo vessels. Service vessels, which include icebreakers and cruise ships were 7% uh, of black carbon emissions within that narrowly defined portion of the Arctic uh, that I showed on the map. This is a breakdown by the flag state of the ships that were operating in the Arctic in 2019. And as you can see, Russian flagged ships account for the vast majority of black carbon emissions in 2019. And this is followed distantly by Norway at, at only 7%. Uh, Russia was 63%. As Sean mentioned in her opening, the IMO is currently working to regulate black carbon emissions from ships. IMO recently completed a three-year work plan. Uh, <laughs> I wish it was three years. A three-step work plan to figure out how to define, measure, and control black carbon emissions and is now deciding how best to regulate black carbon emissions from ships. The work plan itself began in 2011, but progress was slow. So in 2014, the ICCT hosted a series of black carbon workshops. We've hold, uh, hosted six of them so far since 2014, one each year. And this included uh, participants from research institutions, government agencies, engine manufacturers, classification systems, societies, ship owners, and civil society. In 2015, on the far left panel, IMO agreed to a definition of black carbon, and this was based on the recommendation of the ICCT's first workshop to accept the Bond et al. Um, consensus definition of what black carbon is. It took until 2018 for IMO to agree on three appropriate ways to measure black carbon from ships. This is based on the recommendation of our fourth workshop. Just last year, IMO identified 41 potential ways to control black carbon from ships, and 13 of those were recommendations from the fifth ICCT workshop. And next year, IMO is supposed to decide on one or more ways to control black carbon emissions um, from a policy perspective. To assist, the ICCT hosted a sixth black carbon workshop last year in Helsinki. Uh, participants uh, the goal of the workshop was to identify appropriate black carbon control policies and participants identified six of them. They're listed here. These include black carbon emissions limits for ships globally and in the Arctic, both potentially for new ships or also extending to existing ships, a requirement to use newer lower emitting ships in the Arctic, and a requirement to use shore power at port. Uh, but lastly, they also identified a ban on using heavy fuel oil with a switch to distillate or other cleaner fuels. This slide shows the impact of switching from HFO to distillate fuels. The top bars show black carbon emissions from HFO fueled ships, and the bottom bars show black carbon emissions from all ships in the Arctic, and these are based on 2019 emissions. Focusing on the top bars, the red bar shows how much black carbon heavy fuel oil, heavy fuel oil fueled ships emitted in the Arctic in 2019, about 227 tons. And had those ships used distillate instead, they would have emitted just 122 tons, a 46% reduction. And because HFO fueled ships accounted for about two thirds of black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic, switching the HFO fueled ships to distillate 
would have cut total black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic by 30%, which is shown in the bottom bars. To conclude, black carbon emissions from ships are growing rapidly in the Arctic. Fishing vessels and oil tankers were responsible for most black carbon emissions in 2019. Russian flagged ships emitted the most black carbon. The IMO has agreed how to define, measure, and control black carbon from ships. Now it needs to decide on a policy or policies to regulate it. We're expecting that in 2019, or 2021, I should say. ICCT workshop participants identified six appropriate black carbon control policies last year. These were submitted to IMO. And one of those policy options was switching from HFO to distillate, which would immediately reduce black carbon emissions from ships as I showed in the last slide. And so my key takeaway for you is that there are many ways to reduce black carbon emissions from ships. The question is, when will we? I thank you for your attention and back to you, Sean. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to all of our speakers today. We have time for a few questions, about 10 minutes or so. So uh, but perhaps before we take the first question, could I just uh, remind everyone that if you wish to submit a question, please use the Q&A option, and if possible, please indicate who the question is directed to. Our first question is around scrubbers, and Brian, I'm, my, if I may, I'll direct that to you. Uh, does, uh, sorry, I just, something flashed up, so I was screen sharing. I was trying, not intending to, apologies. Uh, scrubber systems, do scrubber systems significantly reduce the amount of PM 2.5 emitted from ships? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question and it requires a bit of a, a detailed answer. Uh, scrubber systems are designed to reduce sulfur from the exhaust. And when you reduce sulfur from the exhaust, you're reducing the PM 2.5 associated with sulfur emissions, including sulfates. Um, one additional component of PM 2.5, as Jim mentioned, was um, black carbon. And so um, the participants at the ICCT workshops have actually looked at this problem and has presented information relating to the black carbon reduction potential for um, scrubber systems. And the effectiveness at reducing black carbon emissions in particular from scrubbers really depends on how the scrubber is designed. Um, the scrubber design um, really impacts whether or not there's any potential reduction um, or not. And we're seeing the black carbon emissions reduction potential anywhere from 0% to about 30 to 50%, depending on how the uh, scrubber is designed, but again, it's, it's quite variable. And the outcome from our six black carbon workshop, one of the potential um, black carbon control policies that the group considered was an Arctic emission control area. Um, and the group agreed that an Arctic emission control area wouldn't be appropriate for um, trying to control black carbon emissions because um, scrubbers could be used and scrubbers have unclear black carbon reduction potential, if any. And also they enable the use of heavy fuel oil, um, which may not deliver black carbon reduction benefits. So I wouldn't count on scrubbers being a, a really effective way to ensure that you're getting black carbon emissions reductions. And of course, um, over 80% of scrubbers today are open loop systems where seawater is being um, brought on board, sprayed into the exhaust, and whatever is being captured in addition to the sulfur, such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heavy metals, which are carcinogens and also, um, also acids, are being discharged overboard. And so you have to consider what the total environmental uh, and potential health impacts are of, of using scrubbers um, and not just on their black carbon potential. Thank you, Brian. Um, our next question is directed to Jim Gamble. Is there already an evidence or statistics available on the impact of, of the stalling of the cruise industry due to COVID, the COVID pandemic, on black carbon concentrations in the Arctic? Yeah, thanks, Sean. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And, and I think in order to answer that, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One is in general that 
there's no routine uh, monitoring of black carbon emissions in the Arctic. And so sort of the data that we saw from Brian, it comes from estimates of, of vessel traffic. So in other words, you're, you're recording vessel traffic showing uh, where the vessels have gone, the numbers of vessels, the types of vessels. Uh, and, and that typically happens after the case, right? So we're seeing 2019 data now. But um, uh, another thing we can extrapolate though from that data that Brian mentioned is that about 7% of Arctic black carbon emissions do come from cruise ships. And so you would expect that if cruise ships aren't sailing in 2020, you would expect of course a reduction of about 7% in black carbon emissions uh, uh, for the Arctic. But that doesn't tell the whole story because uh, cruise vessels uh, tend to operate A, close to shore and B, spend significant time in communities and so they essentially are bringing black carbon pollution really close to populated areas and so uh, in terms of human health significance I think uh, we could say that uh, the absence of cruise vessels probably has a more pro profound effect a more profound positive effect than just reducing black carbon by seven percent in the Arctic um, and another thing I'll mention uh, is that uh, anecdotally there absolutely appears to be uh, evidence that there's reductions in black carbon in, in, in Arctic communities. And, and some communities, Juneau, Alaska is a good example, are actually doing studies to look at air quality uh, this year with no cruise vessels, uh, as I mentioned, to use as a baseline. And so uh, hopefully we should actually have some, some data about the improvement in air quality in, in, in cruise communities. So great question, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to go next to a question to Kristen, and then I think we've got two or three coming in for you, Brian, so I'll, I'll come back to those in a moment. Uh, Kristen, we have a question saying, how problematic is the lack of data from Russia, and do you think it will be forthcoming in the future? Is it a, a problem concerning the measurement, or is it a lack of sharing of the data? Thank you. Uh, very good question. Well, it is problematic in that way that we don't have the full picture uh, from all the Arctic states. Uh, also, of, of course, Russia is a large state, so we know that uh, they uh, have impact and, and uh, we are hoping that we will get uh, the uh, data uh, for the next report. Uh, however, we also fully understand that this is a little bit of a uh, difficulty. Uh, it was decided then uh, when uh, we, were, we were talking about emission data that it would uh, include the whole country, not just the Arctic region. And uh, so there are uh, issues there that need to be addressed, but uh, we are uh, very optimistic on getting the uh, the emission data from Russia for the next report. Thank you. Uh, Brian, the, there's two or three questions aimed at you. Do you want to, I won't read them out, I think you can probably just see them and respond. Uh, sure. Um, the first one, are black carbon emissions dangerous to marine wildlife if they reach the seawater? Um, not my area of expertise, um, but I, I can tell you that the literature on open loop scrubbers is showing that the PAHs and the heavy metals that are discharged um, into the water could harm marine wildlife. And um, we put out a study looking at the overlap of scrubber wash water discharges from open loop systems off the coast of British Columbia and how they overlap with endangered and threatened killer whale species. Um, another question on what barriers, if any, are there to IMO making appropriate policy decisions to reduce black carbon emissions. I think we've known for a long time how to reduce black carbon emissions um, from ships. You can switch to fuels that, um, that emit low amounts of black carbon. You can use marine gas oil with diesel um, particulate filters. Um, you know, there's, we have, we have the options. What is missing, I think, are um, two things. There's been some, delay on agreeing to a standardized measurement protocol, um, which you would like to have in place if you're going to set a black carbon emission standard. But if you're going to have a black carbon policy to um, immediately switch away from heavy fuel oil to distillates, for instance, you don't need to measure um, black carbon from the exhaust to de determine compliance. You just have to look to see if you're using um, the appropriate fuel. 
Um, so I think it's right now um, we're looking for uh, if there's going to be an IMO member state that will take up the issue and champion it and and we'll usher it along uh, because right now uh, there seems to be a lack of, uh, of leadership and political will on the decision making process. Um, there was another one on measurement methods between filter smoke number, um, PAS and LII, uh, which one is best for black carbon measurement. Um, all three have been deemed appropriate by the IMO. Um, at our workshops, we investigated the trade-offs of each approach. Um, it really depends on if you're looking at trying to use the measurements for inventory work or if you're using the measurements for um, policy making. As long as the um, as long as the method can show you the relative reduction in black carbon emissions from an intervention, uh, like pu putting a filter on the ship, uh, if you can show an 80, 90% emissions reduction with, with any of those, uh, which I think you can, then um, those can all be appropriate for policy making. Um, Brian, I'm yes. going to interrupt and try and just take a couple of last questions very quickly because <laughs> I think we're running out of time. Thank you for that. Um, and also just to add to, in terms of policy, we have an opportunity coming up to, or we could have an opportunity coming up to adopt a resolution at the IMO about black carbon. Um, that there's been a proposal on the table for the next meeting, the next time the MEPC meets. Um, and that I think is, is an opportunity we can't afford to miss. Um, last question then, and I think we're out of time. Uh, I'm going to, this has been sent to everyone, uh, but I think what I will do is uh, direct it towards Pam, if that's okay. Northern Sea Route is both economic and geopolitic, is a, both an, of a economic and geopolitic importance in Russia. What's your expectation from the incoming Russian chairmanship of the Arctic Council in terms of having access to data and cooperation with Russian science? Sorry, that was... Uh, I, Kristen, if you want to jump in at the end and add to that as well, that would be great. But but Pam, maybe you could start us off. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, the hope is that there will be very active sharing of information. Russia has tremendously talented and, and excellent scientists. Um, and there's been a lot of cooperative work going on in AMAP uh, over the decades now of the Arctic Council. So uh, I certainly would hope and expect that there would be uh, increased cooperation with and from Russia on black carbon. Um, President Putin has on various occasions with the uh, Finnish president and with uh, the United States president uh, mentioned black carbon as something on which we could cooperate. So hopefully that will be the case during the Russian chairmanship period. Kristen, would you like to add anything? Well, just very shortly. Uh, uh, Russian rep representative in the ETPMC is working very uh, hard with us. And so I'm really positive for the uh, Russian chairmanship and uh, know that this will be done very well. And just like to reflect on uh, Pam's uh, observations here, which I think is very correct. Well, thank you. I'm afraid our hour is up um, and we must conclude our discussion on this important issue. I, I think there's a one or two questions outstanding and we will respond to you um, as, as quickly as we can outside of the webinar. It is our intention to make the recording of the webinar available and the details for that will be circulated in due course. So can I just once again thank our panelists today, Pam, Jim, Kristen and Brian, and also thank you the participants for joining us. I do hope everyone will join us again in a couple of months when we look forward to, dis and, and we look forward to discussing this issue in some more detail and discussing future action uh, to address black carbon emissions. Thank you and goodbye. Bye, thanks everybody. Thanks all, thanks for coming.